which practice that, Jew, that Jewish people do is the most popular. A study in 2014 of American Jews tells us that more than 70% of American Jews participate in a Seder that's affiliated and unaffiliated and also all different parts of the country. You have more than 70% participate in a Seder. Compare that to Yom Kippur, it's a little over 50% fast on Yom Kippur. Kosher, a little over 20% uh, eat kosher. What does that tell us about the Pesach Seder? People are practicing the Pesach Seder more than any other mitzvahs. It's the, ma, it's the one that is more accepted than any other mitzvahs. What's so special about the Pesach Seder? Think also about which Jewish practice more than any other is responsible for the continuity of the Jewish people. On one hand, Torah study, because when you study Torah, that gives us the information and the juice of what to do and inspiration of how to do it and, and to do it with joy and happiness and with enthusiasm. There's also, we spoke about uh, Shabbos, Kashras, all of these are important mitzvahs. But you know with what it started? It started with the Pesach Seder. Because the Pesach Seder was the first mitzvah the Jewish people did the night before they left Egypt. The night before they left Egypt, while they were still in Egypt. Ladies, welcome. While they were still in Egypt, Hashem said to Moshe, tell the people, the last night in Egypt, they will be making a Seder. And they had matzah, and they had murr, and they ate from the, the Pesach lamb. They did it the last night, and he said, now, after doing this mitzvah, you can leave Egypt, march out with an upright head. You are no longer slave. You are my chosen people. How did it start? It started with the Pesach Seder. And since then, every year, on Pesach night, the 14th, the night of the 14th, towards the 15th of Nisan, under a full moon, we've been doing the same thing. That's when we became a people. That's when we became a nation. That is the birthday of the Jewish people. And now, if you have a people, the Torah means something. If you have a people, there's a Shabbos. If not for the peoplehood of, Yid of the Jewish people, of Yidin, the Torah scroll would be some ancient writing in a museum. Like Hammurabi's rock. Who's studying Hammurabi's rock? A few professors. Who is studying the ancient writings of the, Egypt, of the ancient Egyptians? Very little interest is in that. Because it's, these are dead languages and dead cultures. And here for three and a half thousand years, almost three and a half thousand years, we're eating matzah, we're making a seder, so we are making the keep alive. So that transmission from generation to generation, where the Torah says, it's going to come tomorrow and in the future, children will ask you, what is this all about? That's why we are hidden. It's because my father made a Pesach Seder and his father and his father and his father and, his father, and when they were throughout the, the journey of Jewish peoplehood, throughout the world, from, Erzis, from Egypt to Exit Shal, from Exit Shal, this person, the four corners of the world, father to son, parents to children, were transmitting this tradition. And therefore, we studied the Torah, and we kept the Shabbos, and we kept Yiddishkeit alive. So let's analyze the Pesach Seder, because that is the birth. Now a birth makes a whole person. And the idea of the Pesach Seder is to celebrate our own personal exodus of Mitzrayim. <coughs> the Alter Rebbe says it in Tanya, 
chapter 47. He says, don't look at the Pesach Seder as just a historic event, which is of, of course of great significance. For that alone, we should be doing the mitzvahs and celebrating Pesach. But it's more than that. It's not only a national event, but it should be a personal event. That on Pesach night, when we're going to be sitting by the Seder with our family or with our friends, we should reenact the Pesach Seder as if we are le leaving Egypt. Not the geographic Egypt, we're not in Egypt. But there's also that spiritual Egypt, our own limitations, our own hang-ups, our own addictions, our own mishigas, things that are holding us back, some things that may be low and vulgar, or even if we are a very great and upstanding chassid, there's still so much more we can do to connect our Ein Sof to the infinite Hashem. So how do we, Pesach, the word Pesach means to jump over and jump higher and to reach a new level of oneself, to recreate oneself, that is what the Pesach Seder is about. Now that's why the number 10 is very important. Kabbalah talks about 10. The Mishnah talks about 10. What is the importance and the significance of the number 10? The Mishnah says, Hashem created the world with Hasara Mamaris, 10 utterances. That tells us that the number 10 is a complete number. With that, Hashem completed the, the world. And every aspect of the world is connected to one of these 10 Mamaris, one of these 10 utterances. So you can't get more than 10. Completeness is 10. It's also completeness in Torah. Completeness of Torah is also 10. Now it started with Aseris Adibas, the Ten Commandments. Rabbi Nisajigon says the Ten Commandments included in it all of the 613 mitzvahs and everything that came and evolved from the original Torah mitzvahs. It's all hinted to, alluded to in the Matan Torah that was given with, uh, with this, the Ten Commandments. Again, the number 10. The Mechabalim tell us that Hashem has the Ten Qualities, the Esos Firas. And the Koichas HaNefesh, the ten qualities that are in us, are also a reflection of the number ten. Now, the number ten was deep in the muck when the Yidin were in Mitzrayim. When we were in Egypt, we were deep in trouble. And the 200, or more than 200 years that the Yidin were living there, they became so involved and so one with the Egyptians that they became Egyptian. So all of their ten levels, which should have been reflecting the ten spheres of Hashem, ten levels of holiness, were, were polluted and contaminated into klipa, to the degree that the Zoya says that if they would have stayed another moment in Golis, in Egypt, they would have been goners. So when you look at the Pesach Seder, some people say to themselves, well, it's different times. We're living in a very uh, secular world. Uh, some, uh, some people are really um, have a lot of negativity, whether it's psychological ne negativity, emotional negativity, uh, coming from the street, coming from their own hangups, from their own mishigas, from their own troubles. How am I going to get out of this? And the Pesach Seder tells us that, you know, the Yidin were by the cliff and they could have been over the cliff and it would have been a goner. And Hashem rushed them out of, uh, rushed them out of, of Mitzrayim. He rushed them out of Egypt. Not according to the plan. The plan was that there would be 400 years in Egypt. But they were rushed before that time because Hashem saw that they cannot stay longer, they would be so corrupted by the Egyptians, they would be goners, and Hashem would not be able to keep His promise that from the descendants of Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, he will, he will form a nation. So on Pesach night, we have to go from the levels of Tumah, from impurity, and recreate ourselves. And that's why the Kabbalah says, that the, the Pesach Seder is also connected with 10. And that is in the, in the Seder plate. 
Now, this idea of ten in the Seder plate is found in Kabbalah. I have in front of me a copy of the Siddur of the Arizal of Reb Shapsi. I chose this Siddur, even though there are several editions, there are probably a dozen or more editions of the Siddur of the Arizal with the Kavanis, with the meditations. This one, the edition of Reb Shapsi, was used by the Rebbe. Generally, the Rebbe used a regular Chabad Siddur. But by the Pesach Seder and by the Shefer, by, by Tia Shefer, he would bring to the table a Seder of Reb Shapsi. And the Seder of Reb Shapsi is a, a unique Seder of Kabbalah. You can have uh, one sentence of davening or a bracha and the rest of the page are variations of Hashem's name to meditate on. And this Siddur the Rebbe would bring to the Seder, he would have it in front of him together with the, the Haggadah, the regular Haggadah or the Siddur which had the Haggadah in it. And over there it says that the three matzahs represent, and I have three matzahs, they represent Chachma, Bina and Das. They represent the three intellectual qualities of of Hashem and of man. And there are three intellectual kind of wisdom, understanding, and das is knowledge, or really applied knowledge, how to apply the knowledge to emotion. That's Chabad. And he says, on top of those, on top of the matzahs, you should you have over here a diagram. You should put this six, six items. And you should put it in the order that you see in the diagram. The order that you see in the diagram is that you have the bone or some chicken wing or chicken neck on the right, the egg on the left, and the marrow in the center. You're, you're creating the letter segel, right, left, center. And underneath you're doing that again, the charoises on the right, the carpus on the left, the Chazeres, which is also Marer in the center, right, left, center. There's right, left, center, above right, left, center. Segel on top of a segel. That is the way that Rizal said you should set up the Seder plate. You'll see them, <coughs> there are different diagrams of the Seder plate. You'll see in different Haggadahs. But this is the Seder plate that is in, this, in the Seder of the Rizal. And he says that these six, this is set up this way because it corresponds to the six emotions that are in the spheres and in the koiches and nefesh. Kindness on the right, discipline, strictness on the left, tiferes, beauty and balance in the middle. Those are the, the inner feelings. And then there's the extroverted feelings, netzach hoid in yesoid. And they are on top of the matzahs. As if the matzahs, the intelligence, the intellect, gives birth to the, the emotions. So therefore you have three, and six is nine. And then he says that the, you, they should be, all be a, on a plate, and the plate represents malchus. After understanding in the intellect, Chabad, then the emotions, six emotions, the next thing is action, speech and action, to speak what you, what you understand and to express the emotions, to bring it into action, that's malchus. Kingship is because that's the way the king actually rules, makes laws to run his country based on the Chabad and in the end, the, the, the Netzachoy Yisoyed, Netzachoy Chesed Chagaz, Chesed Gvur Tifres, Netzachoy Yisoyed. So all of these are in the Seder plate. The esospheres. Why esospheres? Because when we are by the Seder, these items are the tools which we are going to recreate ourselves totally. We're going to recreate our Chabad, the way we look at things, the way we understand things. We're going to recreate our emotions. And in case we have negative emotions, 
like the Eden when there were slaves in Egypt, they were not only slaves physically, but they also became enslaved with the Egyptian culture. And it was very hard for them to, to shake it off. So we have to free us, ourselves from our enslavement to negativity, to, to, to things that are holding us back. And this is the empowerment that Hashem gives us on Pesach night. So we need the Eses Sviris, which are embodied by the, the Kaira, by the Seder plate. Now, <clears throat> specifically, the, the, um, the, the, when we go back to the matzahs, as we said, there's three matzahs. The three matzahs have other symbols to it. In, uh, what have they got? Some said that the three matzahs represent Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, our three patriarchs. And this is going to come back. Others said it represents Koyan, Levi, Yisrael, the three parts of the nation, of our nationhood. The Kabbalah says the three is Chachma Bina Das. Now all they're related because Koyin is connected with, with the idea of Chachma and um, with Avraham. Uh, the, sec the middle matzah is, is Bina, is connected with Yitzchak. I will explain about this later. It's connected also with Levi. And the, the lower matzah is Das, which is connected to Yaakov and Yisrael. Because Yaakov was the father of all of Israel, and his other name was, was Yisrael. But the common denominator between these three is that it's a food, the main food item that we eat on Pesach. The Pesach Seder mitzvah, the Torah mitzvah of the Pesach Seder, is to eat matzah. And the halacha goes into details of matzah and why we have three matzahs. In the halacha we have three matzahs because we have to have two for lecha mishnah, like there's two breads that we have on the Shabbos table, there's two breads that we have on the Yom Tov table to remember the man that we received uh, in honor of Shabbos. It fell on Friday, two portions. So therefore we have two matzahs. Then we have a third matzah, which is the broken matzah, which is the matzah that represents a poor man's bread. He's, it's a broken matzah. Humility. It's a very matzah-like symbolism to have a broken matzah. So that's what it says in Ishainim. That's what we have three matzahs in the Gemara class. We spoke about it. But the Kabbalah is telling us another idea. The Kabbalah is telling us it's, it's connected with intellectual qualities, Chabad, Chochmah bin Adas. And all of this is combined. There's Halacha, there's Kabbalah, there's Drush. There's many levels in Torah, and there's many levels of experiencing the, the Seder. This is illustrated in a very powerful way in the Rebbe's Haggadah. In the 1940s, before the Rebbe became Rebbe, he printed uh, his notes on the Haggadah. Now this has been translated and developed and so on. I like to look at the original notes. They're very succinct. And what I found fascinating with it is that he probably had in front of, in front of him hundreds of Sfarim, which he cites. He probably sat in a library. I don't know when he started writing it, the previous Rebbe had a library, but it wasn't that big. In Manhattan, there were some uh, world-class libraries at that time. Uh, perhaps he started writing it when he was still in Ber Berlin, which had uh, big libraries in the 1930s before the, the Nazis came to power. But he has citations from dozens of commentaries on the Haggadah, from Kabbalah, from Drush, from Halacha, Gemara, variation of texts, going into the details of the order of the four kashas. The order of the four kashas, some have the order starting with the first question is, why, is, why we eat matzah and not, uh, matzah and not bread? The, the Chabad custom is to ask why we dip twice. And he brings from 
over a dozen sources where the text is the way the Chabad uh, uh, um, has it. And he cites the first print, the Sassino print, the 1480s. The first print has the Agada, has it, the text, which is the more common Sephardic version of it. It's based on the riff, the riff and so on. And he, going into this debate, covering the full span of Torah literature, is in the Rebbe's Haggadah. And this idea of combining the Halacha and the Kabbalah and the Hasidis, all of this was something that, you, that the Rebbe was unique in, and it's so much reflected in the Rebbe's Haggadah. So coming back to the Matzah, so the Matzah is Chabad. Now, the Matzah is essential to the Seder. It's the food that gives us the wisdom to connect with Hashem. Sometimes you have a conversation with people and you have an opinion that is so clear to you and you try to explain it to another person and they just don't get it. You talk and they don't get it. The debate going on in America there's the left is screaming one way, the right is screaming another way, and this is replicated throughout the world. Every country is split in half, or into pieces, and no one's listening. And sometimes when we're part of this debate, hopefully for good things, we can't understand why other people just don't get it. And that's what the mitzvah of matzah is. The mitzvah of matzah is, there's a special spiritual molecules and atoms in the matzah that give us a, a, an understanding of Hashem, of faith. That's why the, the, the Zayar calls matzah michla de mehmenusa, the food of faith. And the understanding of this is that literally when you eat matzah, it, you, it gives you that brain power to understand and to grasp and to connect with the Yiddishkeit. And perhaps that is why everyone feels in, 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 with intuition that this is very important. And that's why it's very important to eat the matzah after nightfall, when it's Pesach. Unfortunately, because of daylight savings time, people are having their Pesach dinner early. But the mitzvah of eating the matzah is after nightfall, and that's when it does its magic. How does this work? So the Alter Rebbe explains in Likutei Torah that it works like food works for an infant. The Gemara says, Ein hatinak yodea likris abba achayitim tam dogen. When does an infant get enough intelligence to call father, mother, abba, ta, ma? This is after he tastes cereal. He tastes dogen, grain. And the grain has it a certain quality that enhances the brain of the child that he should be able to have a sense that he has a father. Similarly, the Alter Rebbe says in Lekut Eteria that by, when the Yidin were in Egypt, Hashem wanted to give them some kind of a vitamin, a potent vitamin, that they should get it. That they should get it, that they should really want to leave not only physically Egypt and not only to leave because they're going to be free from the burden of the slavery, but also to want to leave behind the culture of Egypt, which many Eden still were very much attached to. Hashem wanted them to get it. So it says that when he told them to eat the matzah, is leida lahakas misha amavahayayana. It's a food of faith that enabled them to recognize that Hashem created the world and all of the Egyptian gods and all of the ancient religions were naught and nothing. And matzah is specifically flat and not allowed to rise, which is chametz, because in order to accept Hashem into your life, you have to have bittel. You have to flatten your ego. You have to flatten your urges. That is what Matzah teaches us. And especially this is so if you want to recreate yourself. 
If you really want to recreate yourself, you have to take the paradigm of the Eden leaving Mitzrayim, leaving Egypt. If they want to leave behind the culture of their past, which they are attached to in many ways, intellectually, emotionally, in their habits, you have to recreate yourself. How? You have to flatten your previous personhood and be ready to become a new person. That is matzah. When you flatten yourself and say, I am ready to change. I am ready to become a new person. This is the, what Pesach night empowers us. The words of, of Al-Tareb in Lekut HaTerah, Aydei Bittel v'yiri Allah, Yeitzu mikol ha-meitzor ha-mgvulim, v'chein yitzies mitzrayim b'gashmiz. Physically leaving Egypt was when they were able to flatten their Egyptian hood and say, Moshe, we're leaving with you. We don't know what the provisions are, we're taking our half-baked matzah, <laughs> and we're going. The Prophet says, there's a heart chesed nerayach. The Prophet has says, is mouthing the words of Hashem. Hashem remembers the youth of the Jewish people. When they were just a newborn nation leaving Egypt, and they asked no questions. Why? Because they, they had to flatten, they said, I'm no longer an Egyptian. I'm putting all that aside. Not that they didn't have an attachment to it. In fact, in Tanya it says, they had to run from Egypt because they were still attached to so much of Egypt. They were attached to many of the immoral ways of the Egyptians, to the promiscuity of Egypt, of the Egyptians. And the Torah again and again gives us the long list of forbidden relationship, which was so much part of Egyptian behavior and culture. They were into Egyptian idol worship when they left Egypt. So therefore they had to run. If they would walk, they would have, well, maybe there's some good stuff over here that I'm leaving behind, the glory and the theater and the entertainment and all the celebrities. And therefore they had to run. So, but what is the action? It's to be a matzah. Flatten your past and go forward. And you don't have to understand it completely. Like when the child has, eats the, the grain, the cereal that gives us the intelligence, all it gets intelligence is to call Abba. One word, Father. It's very simple. The faith of the child and trust in his father is very simple. It's not deep. He's just an infant. He just says one word, Abba. It's very simple. But it's so deep. And it's the beginning of the relationship. It's very simple, and yet it's so deep. And the same thing is the Jewish faith. The Michlodem Amnusa, the first step is very simple. Recognize Hashem. Get out of your own Mishigas. Recognize Hashem. Call Abba. Call Abba. Say Hashem, my father. Hashem, my God. Zekeli. Very simple. Doesn't have to be deep philosophy. Doesn't have to be with the depth. That comes later. And that is the essential connection. Kids are loved by their parents. But the kid doesn't really understand what is a parent and the sacrifice of the parent. But the parents love the hug of the kid and they love to hug the kid. Because it's the essential connection. And that is really our faith is essential connection. And matzah makes that essential connection. Now, as we said before, and this is taken from the Siddur of the Arizal, he says... The top matzah is koyin. It's koyin. In fact, the custom is of the Mekabalim and the Hasidim is they first put down the bottom matzah on the Seder plate and they say Yisrael. And then they say this is the Levi and this is the koyin. Koyin Levi Yisrael, he says it. 
Yisadar Oisin Yisrael, Said Hadas Alakayin, of all of Alevi. And that's what it says in the, on the Alter Rebbe's Haggadah, which the Rebbe wrote his commentaries. The Salash Kone Kayra Begil Matzis, Yisrael, Alevi, and Akayin. Now read that. Kayin, Levi, Yisrael, formed the word Kaili. Kof Lamed Yud, Kayin, Levi, Yisrael. Kaili. What's a Kaili? Kaili is a vessel. A vessel. In fact, um, the, the, the Rebbe points out in his Agod, he says, that's why it's preferable to have matzahs that aren't, have, are shaped like a keli. You see, they're rounded. Especially the flat matzahs. They're rounded. So it's like a vessel that holds whatever you put into it. They're rounded. The matzahs are rounded. You see? That's why I put them that way to be a vessel, you see, the round. I could have put it the other way around, you know, this side on top, you know, but he says it should be a keli. So it's a keli. We want to be a vessel to absorb Hashem's blessings. Koyin Levi Yisrael is a keli. And why is that important? It's important because in a keli, what, what is contained in the keli? Blessings, good things, this is on top, Muslim go into that. In Kabbalah, in the keli, in the vessel, there are the lights, oiris, or the keli. There's the lights, the energy flow coming from above. That is a source of physical, physical blessing. It's a source of spiritual connection, there's an energy flow. But the energy flow is like electricity. What's electricity? It's just pure energy. But then you have to connect a keli, an instrument to, to channel that energy. Oh, is this going to be a, a, um, an air conditioner that's connected to the plug, the electricity? Or is it going to be a heater? Depends what the keli is. But you have to connect. Pesach is telling us that we have to become a keli and allow all of these blessings to come into us. You have to stay in one place and wait if it permeate into you. The energy should come into a structure. The motion into stability. To settle in you. This is such a, pro a problem today when we're in the smartphone age where people are supposedly multitasking or non-tasking in anything in, in, with, with, with concentration. Things don't settle in because we're already moving on to the next thing. So it's Kaylee. Be a Kaylee. And, and he said, and, and the, the, the Rebbe brings in his God, in his God that he said, the, 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 the things that are on top, the items that are on top are the Oireis. They are the energy lights that are into the keli. Now, but he points out, that's one way of reading it. But the way it's written in the Alter Rebbe Zagada and Alter Rebbe Shapsi Zagada, it says, first you start with the Yisrael, and then the Lamed is the Levi and then the Koyin. So if you read it that way, Yud Lamed Chav, it's Yelech. What's Yelech? To go. To go. What is the whole purpose of our neshama coming this and down in this world? So it's to be a mahalach. Angels, malochim, are oindim. They stay in one place. They're holy, they're great, they're special. But they are stationary. Let's say they only have what's called one leg. Just they stay there. They're there and they're stay, st staying in one place. A man has to move. It's not enough to be a keli. You have to be also a yelech. Absorb the, the, the matzahs. The matzah. Be a matzah, absorb it. Flatten yourself out. Make yourself rounded out. That you're ready to accept. You're listening. You're a listener. You're a listener. You're absorbing Torah. You're absorbing other people 
in your life. Make room, flatten your ego to be able to accept other people into your life. Ideas, Yiddish guy, Torah, all that is pos positive. Hashem. But don't be a Kaili forever. At the same time, you're killing no that the ultimate goal is to be a Yelech, to be a Mahalach, to move forward. That's what the Rebbe says. It's a Kaili, but also, also Yelech, to move forward in, <coughs> in your life. Now, um, this idea that the Matzahs are Kalim and the, that what's on top of the Matzahs are Oireis, <coughs> So this is an idea that's found in the Rebbe Sagod, and he quotes from the previous Rebbe and the Rebbe Rashab, who said this idea. Now in Israel there was a Makubal, uh, Rebbe Shazal Margolis, who questioned this idea. He was a Makubal, this goes back probably in the 1950s. He was a Rosh Hashiva of one of the Yeshivas of Makubalim, I think Shara Shemayim. And he was friendly with a, a, a Chabad Makobel from Montreal, and he, he saw the Rebbe's Hagod, and he says, "Well, um, you know, where is it written in the Kabbalah?" And so there was a whole exchange of information. The Rebbe explaining that you know this idea of, of matzahs could be Chabad, like we said before in the Kabbalah. It says Reb Shapsi said, and all the Kabbalah Sidurim, it says that it's Chabad. And it doesn't mention Kaili. So the Rebbe says, listen, the Alter Rebbe, this is where all of Chabad Torah comes from. He saw it could be on one hand Chabad, and this could be the emotions, Chagas, Ches, Gvur, Tefres, Tzatzach, and Yisai. On one hand is the symbolism, but a lot of mitzvahs have many messages on different tracks at the same time. So it's okay for, for it to be Aires and Kalim, and at the same time it could be representing Chabad and uh, the, the intellectual, the intellect and the emotions, the Chabad and the 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 Netzach Hoygisay Malchus and 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 Netzach Hoygisay. But then the Rebbe <laughs> has a clincher over there. This Rebbe Asher Zalman Margolis, he had a question that he asked other Makabalim about. The Kabbalah way of setting up the Kaira. And all the Kabbalim say, first you put the matzahs on the plate, which is the intellect, and on top of that you put the emotions. And he had a problem with that, this Makobal. He said, the intellect is higher than the emotions. When you look at the map that's drawn out in all the Kabbalist books, the intellect gives birth to the emotions. The intellect is capable of controlling the emotions. Chabad is higher. First is Chabad, Chachma bin Adas, the intellect. And through the development of the intellect, it gives birth to emotions. So the, really the matzahs should be on top of the six items which represent the emotions. And he wrote this uh, to the Munkach but there was a whole debate about this. And the Rebbe answers this, he says, well, look at the way the, the Rebbe Rashab explained it. He said, well, he said, the matzahs are keili, and the six items represent the oyer. The oyer is always in the keili. The oyer fills the keili. The keili is on the, always in the bottom. The utensil is always in the bottom to receive what's on top of it. So if you move beyond the symbolism of the intellect and emotion, which is in the Kabbalah Siddurim, and you go to the symbolism that is used by uh, the, the, the Rebbes, that the matzah is keili, a utensil that receives in it, and the energy that is received in it is represented by these items, so then it does make very much sense to have the, the items on top of the matzahs to represent this other idea of how the oyer, the energy, is in the utensil. Now, <clears throat> one of the questions that is asked uh, is about the mar. If you're going to talk about the Kabbalah, and the Kabbalah says 
uh, that the six, the six items that are on the center plate, so there's the right, left, and center, the right representing chesed, kindness, the left is, is justice and judgment and strictness, and the center is balance. So the question is raised, why is mara in the center? Mara, the bitter herbs. It should have been on the left side. Judgment, strictness, punishment. Why is Mara in the center? Which is an interesting question. Now, as I said before, this order of having it right, left, center, right, left, center, this is the order that is according to the Kabbalah. And as I said before, a lot of different, uh, there are different customs in it. But those who follow the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah have the order of the of the the six items this way and that begs an answer why are the bitter herbs in the center the bit the, it symbolizes usually the middle the middle so the rabbi answers this question in his agad and he says he asks this question it should have been on the left because it's judgment it's bitterness and he explains <coughs> that bitterness in life is not an end in itself. Bitterness is the squeeze to get the juice out. The olive doesn't give its oil until you crush it. And he says, when a person has bitterness, it, and it moves him to call to Hashem, it awakens great mercy, Rachmim Rabbim. If he feels his the distance, his distance through in the bitterness, that the bitterness that is in his lot, unfortunately. And that was the lot of the Jewish people when they were slaves in Egypt. And because of that bitterness, they called to Hashem. So that bitterness results in a, in a deep connection with Hashem, which is Rachman, which is the center. Rachmanis is always in the center. Midas Rachman. There's Chesed, Gvura, Rachman. Midas Adin, Midas Chesed, and Midas Rachman. Rachman is the center. There's a, a, a long discussion about that. So the balance, there's balance. And I think the lesson over here is very powerful. That when a person is experiencing bitterness, don't stop by becoming bitter yourself. Unfortunately, so many people, when bitterness comes their way, become embittered. And they let it out on their spouse, on their family, and their friends and neighbors. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. The bitterness is just the beginning for which one person should find himself, to, to, to look for the lessons of life that he can learn from this to make him grow and to become a better person. That is what this is all about. And that's why the Beerus is the center to find balance in life, which the, the Kava and Tsoi, the middle is, to find the balance in the right and the left, to find the center. That's why Mur is in the center. Because it moves the person to Rachamim, to Hashem's mercy, which is also in the mid, the center. This idea is also reflected in uh, another of the mitzvahs that we do uh, by the Seder, which is Kairach. There's the Matzamara sandwich. There's a Matzamara sandwich, which halachically there's a great significance in the connection of the ancient times, in the time of the Beis Hamikdash, according to Hillel. Uh, they had to make a sandwich of the matzah and the mar and the lamb, the Pesach lamb. So they had the Pesach lamb, they made the sandwich, they ate it all together. And we replicate that in the beginning of the meal, we eat the mar together with the matzah. We don't have a lamb because we don't have a Pesach mikdash. And we'll speak about the Pesach lamb later on. But the point over here is, what we have is matzah mar. So matzah is the better freedom. Mar is bitterness. Don't just have mar alone. 
Yes, we first eat the matzah and there's the myrrh, then put them together. This is a similar idea and a similar message that if you have, the, look at the bitterness that we experience in life and all of us have in the roller coaster of life moments when they're down and even bitter. And you should know that don't have the bitter alone. Get your matzah. Have humility. Flatten your ego. Recognize and appreciate that we have with what to grow. And use that uh, situation in life to find balance, to bring matzah together with the mar. Don't leave it at the mar alone. That's the symbolism of kairach. Now, this idea of taking tough situations and turning it around is also uh, illustrated in one of the myths, one of the laws of Pesach. And you, you, ha you have to get Haggadah and follow the Haggadah. As I said before, there's so many beautiful Haggadahs in English and in all languages. There are several editions of Chabad Haggadahs, um, which has some Kabbalah insights into it. Now, everyone agrees that when you have the three matzahs, so in the beginning of the Seder, you put aside the the top matzah, or you, some people do it under the covers that are on top of it, and you take the middle matzah and you break it in half. It's the middle matzah you break in half. So half of it you put aside to eat at the end of the meal, afikomen. We're going to soon going to get to the afikomen, because it's a mitzvah to start the Pesach meal with matzah and to end the Pesach meal with matzah. So why do you take the middle matzah and you break it? So as I said before, in halacha there is a discussion about taking this matzah and breaking it. But in Kabbalah, this is a big deal. The middle matzah. We said before that the three matzahs symbolize Avraham and then Yitzchak and Yaakov. Also, Bina, the middle matzah is there for Yitzchak, Bina, Levi. Now, Yitzchak, he was the, pay, oh, oh, the, 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 the embodiment of discipline and strictness. Avram, our first patriarch, our first of the others, he was kind and open. His tent was open on all four sides. Everybody was invited to celebrate life. And he specifically set up his tent in the desert so people would come by and they would, they would have food what to eat and he would share with them Yiddishkeit. That was Avraham. Yitzchak was the epitome of discipline. He was very disciplined, very strict with himself. For him it was easy to, to, sac to allow uh, Avraham to sacrifice him. Yitzchak, pachad Yitzchak. He had the awe and the fear of Hashem and that intensity. Yitzhak represented strictness and intensity. Yaakov, he was already balanced. He already balanced the kindness of Avram with the strictness of Yitzhak. Now, it's the matzah that represents Yitzhak that you break. And half of it you eat in the beginning of the Seder and the other half at the end of the Seder. You start the Seder with, the, with it and you end the Seder. The Kabbalah says the breaking of this matzah is very important because you have to break strictness. You have to break judgment. It's too intense. We are speaking before about finding balance. When you have bitterness to move you to balance from Gvura to Rachmim, we spoke about before. So over here, the Rebbe brings the breaking of the matzah. This is also from the, the fifth Rebbe. You break the matzah because it's Yitzchak, it's Gvura. Also, Bina is connected with Gvura. It's that intellectual level that defines things, that judges things. It, it develops an idea because it judges the idea. So that's why in the Kabbalah, 
Gvur is the, is the source of all judgment. Shredish HaGvur is. It's very intense. It's very powerful. So you have to break it. It shouldn't be. You have to soften it. The words in the Kabbalah is sweeten. Hamtoka Sagvuras. Gvura is also, the, the, the Chabad custom is, to break, after you break it in half, and half you leave in the, in the plate, the other half you break into five pieces. Because when the Kabbalah says uh, this level of intensity, of Gvura, of strictness and judgment, there are five pieces to it. It's been compared to the five fingers of the hand. Why does the hand have five fingers, not four, not six? The Kabbalah says there's a reason, because this reflects the Hei Gvuris. If we, Chaz Shalom, wouldn't have fingers, we'd be able to lift objects, but we wouldn't get into the details. To get something into the details, that's Gvura. Judgment judges and analyzes. Gvura is where judgment comes from. How does judgment work? Strictness. Strictness is, ah, you did this slight thing wrong. The, the absolute attitude of strictness is, the smallest thing that you're out of line, ah, I got you. It's in the details. And that's why the number five is connected with gvurais. Because you see this in the fingers, that if you want to get into the details, you need fingers. Without fingers, you can move things, but it's all generalities, big things. You want to make something refined, you need five fingers. Shatsu Hashem did it. reflects the, the Hegvurs. So therefore the Minik Chabad is that that half of it, you leave in the plate, the other one you break into five to represent the five Gvurs. But it, it's, the breaking of it is, yes, it's very important to be intense. We need intensity. You have to care about things. You have to be passionate about things. Sometimes Many of us are not passionate about anything or passionate about nonsense. Passion, intensity is important. Do you care? Sometimes we ask people, do you care about this? Or do you care about me? Or do you care about your children? Or do you care about Israel? Do you care about Yiddishkeit? Do you care? Because you have to have some fire. You have to have some passion. And then sometimes... You're so on fire and you're so impassioned about things, you gotta take a shower. <laughs> you gotta break it down. You have to break it up a little bit. You gotta cool it. So that is sweetening the gvuras. And the words that the, the Rebbe brings, Hamtokas uh, Gvuras the Yitzchak. We have to sweeten the gvuras of Yitzchak. The middle matzah is Yitzchak, it's the Yitzchak matzah. You gotta break it, and then you break it into five, it represents the worst. And how do you sweeten it? You turn it into the afikaiman. Afikuman, the word afikaiman, is generally translated as the dessert, because that's the last piece of matzah piece of matzah that we eat at the end of the of the meal. Because that's the dessert. That's with, with that we we're going to end the Pesach Seder. And there's details to that. But at this point, we, the, the Rebbe emphasizes you're taking the intensity and you're turning it into a dessert. Sweeten up. The word afikoimen is made up of two words, afikuman. Bring out the dessert. Man is food, sweet luxury foods. Afikuman. Hashpas mazain chesed avram. We tell Yitzchak, or the quality of Yitzchak, sweeten yourself up with like your father's quality, Avram. What did Avram do? He served. He served food. Take the matzah of Yitzchak and break it up, sweeten it up, and turn it into Avram. Avram wasn't perfect because it was all chesed, all kindness. That's why he had a Yishma. Uh, um, Yitzchak wasn't Perfect, because he had an Esav. It was Yaakov, mitos Shlema. It was Yaakov that he represented the perfect. 
So that is, the Yitzhak is turned into Afikoyimim. And that brings us to the, the way we close the Seder. We close the Seder with a piece of matzah at the end of the meal. And that piece of matzah is a discussion in the Rishonim, what does that represent? And the, the consensus in the, the most uh, accepted opinion uh, it was that it represents the Pesach lamb that was eaten at the end of the meal. In ancient times, the preferred way to celebrate Pesach was Yerushalayim. And you had a wonderful meal. And when did they actually eat the matzah and the mur and the lamb? Was the dessert of the meal. You're hungry? Eat. Get rid of your hunger. But now the highlight is the lamb. So they had filet of lamb. What was so special about the lamb? It wasn't how it was prepared. It had to be roasted. Yeah, they could have put some good uh, seasoning on it. <laughs> they probably had a, a way of making it delicious. But it was a filet of lamb. You know what's so special about this? This lamb came from God's table. It was from Hashem's table. How is the lamb from Hashem's table? Because that lamb, that lamb meat, came from a lamb that someone from the family or from the group would go to the Beis HaMikdash, to the Temple Mount, over there, that uh, the lamb's blood was sprinkled on the Mizbeach, and it was, it was sacrificed for Hashem in the Beis Hamikdash, and the in the, the Gemara and uh, describes lines of people, thousands of people lined up from all sides, each with their lamb. That the lamb meat should that the lamb should be part of a sacrifice in the base of English. And they would take it home because now this lamb is from God's table. They're sitting, you know whose guest we are on Pesach night? We are Hashem's guests. And that was symbolized by the lamb meat, which actually came from the base of English. Now everyone then went home with their lamb. And over there they would roast it and then fillet the lamb. And the law was, the halacha was, don't eat it when you're hungry. Allah soiva. Get rid of your hunger. Put your physical needs aside. And then let's now enjoy the lamb. This is the lamb. The first time they ate the lamb was where? In Egypt. The night before they left Egypt, Hashem said to them, everyone should take a lamb. And it was called the Pesach. And because of the, this lamb, because of the blood of this lamb that you'll put on the doorpost of your home, Hashem says in the merit of this mitzvah, which you showed and demonstrated, that the lamb which was the eye that was, was the, one of the gods of the Egypt, Egypt, you're going to sacrifice that and put the lambs on your doorpost and saying, I'm taking the Goy out of me. I'm taking the Egyptian out of me. And I'm going to flatten my ego like a matzah. And I'm ready to become a new person. So that was replicated all the years when the Jewish people, for over a thousand years, when the Jewish people lived in the Holy Land and we had a temple. And we, if you want to eat a lamb and be a guest on Hashem's table, you had a lamb, some lamb meat. That was the highlight of the meal. It was the end of the meal. And what was the taste of the lamb meat that everyone went home. After the lamb meat, you were not supposed to eat anything. And this lamb meat is called Pesach. Pesach means to jump. When Hashem jumped over the Jewish homes. The Rebbe many times in a letter that he would write in connection to Pesach, he would say, the two most important names for this holiday, which you find in our literature, is Chag HaMatzos, the holiday of the Matzos, and Chag HaPesach, 
the holiday of the Pesach. These two symbolize the two goals that we should set for ourselves on Pesach, on the Pesach holiday and the Pesach night. The matzahs and the Pesach. Matzah, we said before, is to get rid of Egypt, to get rid of your negativity. Pesach re represents to go forward. It's not enough just to wash away the dirt. So now you're clean. Now what are you doing with your life? It's to build yourself up. The matzahs represents flattening out your, pre your past, flattening out your ego, flattening out all the negative energy that you have. Flat matzahs. Leaving the Egypt. But the purpose of leaving Egypt wasn't just to leave Egypt. The Jewish concept is freedom is not for the sake of breaking shackles. And now I broke my shackles and now what? So now let's party forever and ever. That is not the Jewish idea of freedom. Maybe in some cultures, they broke the shackles of their masters and now they have freedom. So what are they doing? They're partying, they're drinking beer, they're getting drunk. I can do what I want. What do you want to do? I just want to do what I want. So they're running around aimlessly and without purpose and without meaning, a meaningless, empty freedom. Hashem says, Freedom is that now after you break your shackles, what are you going to do with your life? And Hashem gave us the Torah and He gave us purpose and He set no limitations. Matzah is to flatten the negativity. Pesach is to jump. It's not enough just to grow. It's not enough to, to, to grow. You can jump and reach for things that are higher than you. Be a Pesach. That's why it comes from Hashem's table. It comes from Hashem's table. And we eat it at the end of the meal. Which that itself has an important lesson. How do we see our Yiddishkeit? Is our Yiddishkeit just to, to fill our hunger? We have to ha look at our Yiddishkeit not just to fill our physical needs. Our physical needs Hashem should satisfy. This, of course, we are counting on Hashem to take care of our physical needs. But when it comes to finding meaning in life, we should see ourselves as, right now my physical needs are taken care of. I need to find a certain delicacy in life. I need a purpose in life. I want to find meaning. I want to jump higher. Pesach. To pass over. To jump over. To reach to certain heights, to be able to say, I am in the company of Hashem, that I'm eating from Hashem's table, I'm in the company of Hashem. I have godly qualities, and godly capabilities. What is godly is infinite. What is godly has no bounds. That is the higher level of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim, of leaving Egypt. Not only am I leaving Egypt, leaving behind negativity, but I now have an opportunity to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that's what the Pesach Seder. There's one theme of the Pesach Seder. First, it's, it's the first half before the meal is talking about how we were slaves and I'm talking about our past. And, I, and it goes, the past goes back to the times of Avram Avinu. And Terah, Avi Avram was idol worshippers. We, we were attached to the idol worship. We were, attached, we were in slaves. And then we were freedom. We thank Hashem for this freedom. The second hala, after, after the meal, we're just praising Hashem. And we're saying Hallel. And we're, we're connecting and we're setting ourselves a certain image of Mashiach, Lashon Ababa Yishalayim, of a better world. And a better world is starting with becoming a better self, with making that leap of faith. Pesach means that leap. That leap is becoming a better person. And, and um, yes, I know each one of us had Pesach last year and the year before and the year before. And we have our dreams and our disappointments. 
the more dreams a person has, the more disappointments it doesn't have. But this is this is what 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 we are t- we were taught, and that Yiddishkeit every year, b'chol der every generation, every year and every day, we're supposed to see ourselves as capable of freeing ourselves from the shackles for our own limitations, some which is negative, some which is holding us back, and, and even things that are high, but are. We, we're scared to make that jump and this is the time Pesach that we should make that jump and become a better person a better human being and make this world a better world and we should actually merit the Shana Baba Yerushalayim last year's last year's Lashana Baba be fulfilled now so this year Pesach we're going to be Yerushalayim Shana Baba Yerushalayim